Hi, everyone. Welcome to Interchange. I'm Dan Jones. Thank you so very much for joining us. We're going to have an interesting conversation today. We'll talk about what the future holds for the Milwaukee public school system. Is it a system in decline or a system that should be compared to a phoenix rising on its way back? We'll talk about the holiday Kwanzaa. Is it politically incorrect to criticize it as a useless holiday, or is that just way, way off base? And we will talk about what the playoff season will be like for the Green Bay Packers. All right, let me introduce everybody. We, of course, have longtime newspaper columnist Joel McNally and Kevin Fisher, former broadcast journalist, political analyst, and oftentimes a fill-in host over on WISN Talk Radio. You know Denise Calloway, community affairs and public relations professional. And you know Gerard Randall, education consultant and local job creation expert. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. Let's talk first about the new report from the Public Policy Forum that says Milwaukee Public Schools seem to be on somewhat solid financial ground for the time being at least. Thanks in part to Act 10 and the actions of the current MPS board, its superintendent and administration. But the report wonders if the future is shaky because of a few things. Uncertain levels of taxpayer funding, it's a district which has lost tens of thousands of students to private choice charter and suburban schools, and it has tremendous legacy costs, mainly because of retiree benefits. What has to change, Denise, for this district to make a, make a system that is thriving? Well, I think that the Board of School Directors and the administration has gone a long way in putting it on the right track. The changes that were made in terms of for fiscal reasons um, as it relates to employee benefits, um, while difficult for the board to make, were absolutely necessary for the board's short-term and more long-term financial health. The things that have really taken place since Dr. Thornton has been there in terms of improving academic achievement by developing some really comprehensive plans around mathematics, science, literacy, those are the things that are in place. But the, the public policy forum report really does talk about the, the, the real issue that the district faces is that it, it, it's not in control of its own financial situation in large part because the district receives so much money, not necessarily from, from property tax bills, it receives a relatively small percent from that, but 75% of the district's money comes from state and federal funding. And if we know anything over the past two years in particular when it comes to state funding, that funding has really been unstable. So the district uh, has done a lot as much as it can to be in control of its own destiny in terms of both finances and academics. The question <coughs> is, how do we work to make sure that with 75% of its, uh, the funding for the district coming from the feds and the state, the vast majority of that coming from the state, how do we take a look at some kind of stable level of funding that will help the district survive? The other thing that, that was stated really clearly in that particular report is that MPS's spending is not out of line. When you take a look at the reason why it's per pupil tends to be so much higher than other districts in the state, and particularly other districts in the immediate area, it's due in large part to the fact that it receives so much federal funding for poor children, children who have special needs, children who are English language learners, and other support that comes when you have a high poverty district. Kevin, will it ever be a great district? Could it ever be a great district when, when it has a student population that is so poor and so transient? I'll answer that by telling you what people who have taught in MPS tell me, who talk about the glory days. They say, no, those days are over because of so many of the inherent problems major urban school districts have today. It's, it's, you can't turn the clock back and make MPS the MPS that it was in the 1950s and 1960s. That's just not going to happen. But what it can do is do what it can to control its own destiny. And I think unanimously on this panel, a, a month or two ago, we talked about this very issue uh, that the superintendent and the school board are to be commended for taking measures to control health benefits, uh, pensions, et cetera, et cetera. That has to be done. And I, I think that, that the report was not re revelationary. I mean, you, you, we know all these things. We know that down the road it's <coughs> going to be very tough, with declining enrollment especially. Uh, yes, school choice has had an impact, but I don't think you can blame them because lots of parents wanted to take their kids out of MPS and move them to other schools. It's going to be a tough sell. I think this year in the legislature, 
that there, there will be increased aid for K through 12 public schools throughout mm -hmm. the state. That's the rumbling I'm, I'm hearing out of Madison. But, but it's a tough sell to outstate legislators. And this isn't a criticism, it's just the reality. When you have what is a failing school system, you have declining enrollment, it's very tough to go to the legislature and say, give us more money, we need more money, when you have those kinds of, kinds of factors. But there are things they can do that I think they're top heavy when it comes to administration. Get more money in the, in, the, in the classroom. Let teachers have more control of what goes on in the classroom and, and their curriculum. And maybe there you can probably save some money. Joel, every time we talk about MPS, you always say MPS is a problem that if you throw money at it, it will be fixed. Well, it, I don't know any problem uh, that you have that you don't try to solve with money. I mean, when all our rockets were blowing up and we didn't think we were ever going to get into outer space, yeah, we spent a lot of money on it and we got to the moon, okay? Uh, if you have a school system that not only has the most difficult educational problems, but I got to say this about the Republican legislature and this governor who, who obviously cut, you know, the, the largest educational cut in history. Uh, they have no concern about education in general. and even more specific, they have no concern about MPS. Uh, for 20 years, uh, we've had this choice system, uh, this voucher system, uh, which takes kids out of the school district and then pretends as if these aren't Milwaukee kids that Milwaukee taxpayers are paying for, and therefore there's a funding flaw because they say, well, you have all this expensive property in, in, in Milwaukee, and therefore uh, there's more you know, community you know, wealth behind each student in MPS than there really is uh, after you've taken you know, tens of thousands of students out of the system and put them into private schools. Uh, so, you know, and we've known that. We've known that this is unfair to Milwaukee and, we, and the Republicans have no interest in doing anything about it. And they have no, you know, Kevin claims that they might restore a little bit of the enormous cuts they've made, uh, but that's just restoring a little bit of the enormous cuts they've made. When you have more problems here in education and, and tougher problems, we don't need, you know, it'd be nice if we got equitable funding here in, in Milwaukee, but we actually need more than equitable funding because we have the most difficult educational problems in the state. You, 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 always, you always hear, Gerard, that Milwaukee needs the bucks. We can't lose the bucks because we need the bucks to be a great state. And you're state. losing the bucks and all we, the time. And, and, we need, <laughs> and we need the brewers because if we lose the brewers, Milwaukee's not a great city. Does Milwaukee need a good public school system to be, to be considered a great city or not? Well, yes. And that's what the business community has been arguing all along, and that's one of the reasons why they were supportive of school choice programs. 20,000 view, a 20,000 foot view of, of what's needed. First off, the expectations of any urban public school district has to be realistic. You have to look at public schooling in the context of these communities that they are trying to serve. If, as Everyone has already pointed out. You've got communities that are stressed with poverty, that are stressed with uh, immigrants that are coming in that need uh, uh, special support because of language barriers. All these things do require additional funding. And we're sitting on top of a district that has an old funding formula that simply doesn't work in the context of today. That has to be addressed. But it has no to one be addressed. the answer to that one, by the no way. No one well, wants to address no, that. No, but, but, there, but there I are think answers. the expectation the has to, to be that to look at those. if you are going to have a successful school district, then you're going to have to have a reasonable source of funding that's, that, that goes into that district to support all those things the district is expected to deal with. And if you're expected to deal with health issues, bilingual issues, uh, mental health issues, because 20% of the kids in the Milwaukee public schools have some type of special needs that have to be addressed. That number grows as the population of kids who don't have those issues shrinks within the district and it becomes more expensive to have to work with them. So I, I'm, and then let's put on top of the fact that you need to have professionals who are well trained, who are committed to wanting to work with that special population that requires some special development, uh, but, professional but, development funding too, that the state seems to be unwilling to, but Dan, you, you'd to ask provide for. Whether or not MPS can be a great school system again, 
And I don't think we have as a community any choice but to answer that yes. Does that mean somehow that we would have expectations that are any less for 80,000 kids because of their special needs, because of the fact they live in poverty, because of race? The, the answer has to be no. The answer is that MPS can be a great school system, but we as a community have to demand that, not only in what we demand from the district, but in what we're willing to demand from ourselves to get the district, and more importantly, it's not the district, it's these 80,000 children where they need to be. And the Metropolitan Association of Commerce says that is the most important thing we can have, right. but if they really think that, those businessmen need to put their money where their mouth is. We're moving them in that the direction. Politicians are screwing over MPS, and the businessmen have to step up, step up and do it. All right, next topic. State Senator Glenn Grothman caught some flack the other day when he very publicly blasted the African-American holiday Kwanzaa. He says it's just a holiday created by racist radicals years ago that most black people really don't even care about. He wonders why, as a society, do we keep pushing this as an alternative Christmas for African-Americans? Does he have any point whatsoever? No, <laughs> he's an idiot. Uh, he, he is a racist. He, uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, Kwanzaa is not an alternative to Christmas. Uh, Kwanzaa is a black community uh, cultural holiday. And uh, it was created in the late 60s and it is, is based on tremendous, seven tremendous principles that you would think uh, even a fool like Glenn Grothman would support. You know, unity and, and, and uh, working and taking responsibility, uh, building community, through family and, and uh, it's just absurd. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, and it's silly that we're even talking about him because uh, you know, the, the Republicans on that side of the room should be embarrassed by him and should sh Republicans should stand up when one of their members says something so foolish um, you know, it, like it's you, embarrassing. You it's Joe embarrassing. Biden it's embarrassing <laughs> for the. I'll stand up for Joe Biden any day. He has never said anything that idiotic, oh. and and you and you should not uh, stand up for a racist fool who doesn't know what he's talking about. It, is is he racist or is he just being politically incorrect? I I know Glenn Grothman, and he's so uh, do I. No, no matter <laughs> what you think about him, he's he's not racist. He's not a fool. He's not an idiot. He does. I I will say this. He does speak out often about items that he's very passionate about. And I, I, uh, I empathize with, with uh, Kwanzaa supporters and those who celebrate Kwanzaa, especially this time of year, because I've had, I've had to endure the annual war on Christmas. So I do sympathize. Um, uh, I worked in the legislature for 15 years. And here, here's, here's my take on this. Um, if I was advising Senator Grothman, uh, I would have said, look, it's the end of the year. Here are your options. If you want to make press and you want to do, put out a, a statement or a news release or a, or a column that be picked up by, by, by your local press or, or outlying press, how about do a, 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 an, a, an obligatory year in review? Uh, look at what the legislature did in 2012. Uh, do a, a Christmas or New Year's message to your con constituents. Talk about what you hope to accomplish in, in 2013 in, in the Wisconsin State Senate. I would have definitely steered him aw away from this because if you want to celebrate Kwanzaa, if you want to go to Hallmark and purchase a Kwanzaa card, by all means, do it. I, 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 don't, I don't think this was the right approach by the Senate. I, I don't think Glenn Grothman takes uh, advice too well, though. He doesn't. Um, to me, this was... Uh, just misguided priority. Um, I, you know, I even uh, tried to give him some credit for maybe having done some research, but what a waste of time. It's a waste of time to criticize someone else's celebration, and a celebration in particular that's premised on some solid positive principles. And, and, and for him to talk about uh, all of the things that he finds disagreeable with the founder of Kwanzaa, what he didn't talk about were all of the positive principles that are celebrated in Kwanzaa. All those things that uplift a community, black and white, or any other uh, race or religion. 
And, and that to me is what's so disappointing, that he spent all of this time on the attack instead of actually taking some time to think about what good there is in this celebration that ought to be celebrated by him as well. There was it, no, no, no I, upside to this. And no, no. And, he, no. and he had to know that he was going to get the flack that came his way. He I had think to he know. loves it. Is it is yeah. it divisive at all to tell little kids in grade schools here's a here's a holiday just a Christmas holiday just for the Black American population? Well, it's, it's, you have Christmas, it's, it's they not have Kwanzaa. For Black folks, <laughs> no. I mean, right. it, it tends to it, it is a holiday that is open for those who want to celebrate those principles. I've been to Kwanzaa celebrations where there are white folks in the room too, mm -hmm. who get it, who understand the fact that we're celebrating each day a pillar and a principle that helps to enlift and to empower people. Now, for a politician who, during his tenure in the Senate, has, has complained about the fact that people aren't doing things to empower themselves, how do you criticize a holiday that is founded on seven principles that are all about people taking responsibility, building community, and working together? If he would have actually, I think Gerard's right, if he would have actually done any research to find out what the principles and pillars are behind Kwanzaa, he might have actually said, wow, this is the same stuff that I've been saying that people need to do to take responsibility for themselves. So it, it was misguided, short of having the four of us and, and other folks who've been talking about this for the past few weeks spend their time talking about uh, the senator, um, and his comments, I'm really trying to figure out why he would make the kind of comments that, that, that he did. They're, they're, it's become it, a national story. It, it has become a national story. And, you know, and it, not it, a very it, flattering one for Wisconsin. Not a very flattering one for Wisconsin. It, it isn't. <laughs> you know, of all, the, of all the things in this state that we have to work with and that, that are challenging to us, of all the ways that we need to work together to try to find solutions to the really tough problems that we face. I really don't think we want one of our state senators, someone who's seen as a leader in his community, taking on this issue, which, you know, quite frankly, he's, he's just, he's it, just it wrong should be, about. It should be not low on his priority list. It shouldn't it be should on even his be on priority, 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 <laughs> priority I mean, list. How, how and, and, How many of his and the, constituents in West Bend who celebrate Kwanzaa well, brought this to his attention? Well, the, 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 the timing, too, is atrocious. I understand Kwanzaa is right now, mm -hmm. but it's also a time where uh, uh, people are celebrating all kinds of festivities right. and, and activities, and it's the season of the good tidings. Uh, I drove down. I got to tell you, you know, you know let, let's, let's, let's spread you, good cheer and not this kind of. I, 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 I got to tell you, Kevin, though, if you think there's a war on Christmas, don't worry about it because Christmas is going to win. Uh, <laughs> and, and Christmas will continue to be celebrated. Well, that's good. And, and we, but but and, I, I wish. And, and, and liberals will even allow it to go well, forward. Well, that's that's good to hear. But you're because gonna every, year I, <laughs> every year I every year I see something different that kind of disappoints yeah, me. Yeah, it's, it's mostly by right wingers like you saying there's a war on Christmas. Well, Pick right. on is Sweetest there? Day. That is a fake holiday. <laughs> no, Sweetest that, Day? No, that's Sweet, not, that's that's Sweetest that, Day. That, no, no, no. That is, sweetest Day. That is Pick not a fake holiday. I know because. Because if I don't observe it, I get hit in the head. <laughs> so it is not. You do your research. All right. Let's, help you out, Kevin. Let's talk for just a few minutes about the Packers' chances this playoff season. It starts Saturday night, tomorrow night, with a game against the Vikings again. Last week when they lost to the Vikings, you have to wonder if this oh. will be the Packers' last game of the season no. or do they bounce back strong at Lambeau Field? The Packers are a better team. They are a far better team than the Vikings, and the Vikings have done something to make themselves a little bit more than a one-dimensional team with Adrian Peterson uh, as running back. But, you know, Peterson had a lot that inspired him in that last game, too, to um, – he was trying to break <coughs> a record. Uh, that clearly won't be uh, an opportunity now. They are in the playoffs, um, I think uh, – they may have something of a letdown, and I hope that the Packers are a lot more inspired because the quality of this team is one that could go all the way to the Super Bowl if they are playing the same kind of inspired ball that they played two years right, ago. The, the risk of sounding like a homer, uh, I, I just can't see Christian Ponder, who was the difference in the mm -hmm. last Sunday's mm -hmm. game, not Adrian Peterson. Mm -hmm. he, Christian Ponder had the game of his very young career. <laughs> and I don't see that happening again 
uh, Saturday night. Uh, he's, I, I just don't see it. I, I think most I, 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 And uh, we've he's got also, receivers he's, back. He's, he's, he's got terrible receivers. They are the one-dimensional. He's never been in a playoff situation before. And the Packers have a much better surrounding cast to their quarterback than, right. than Minnesota does. It's in the cold. Yeah. And if they bottle up Peterson, <laughs> I, I heard on the radio today that, you know, all his big runs against the Packers has been when he's gotten outside. When he goes up the middle between the tackles, he doesn't get very much. So bottle him up. Don't let him get free on the outside. Is Rodgers going to shine tomorrow? Of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, he, he's, he's playing at his house. We're not playing in some old Humpty Dome. Um, if they and, protect him, though, they need to. Right. Yeah, they, but, and they, they'll protect him. But I, I do think that Gerard's right. This is a better team. Um, I, I think that the Packers are going to be, we're playing on our own turf. We're playing in the cold. And you know what? You can open the doors all you want to, to, to give people the simulation of cold. There is nothing like that wind and that bone-chilling cold in Lambeau to really, you know, cause you to, Maybe lose a little bit. That is the smartest thing you have said this year. Uh, (laughs) I agreed with you once today already. (laughs) What more do you want? It's starting to scare me. Four (laughs) days into the year. (laughs) The Vikings have not won a game outdoors Mm -hmm. this season. Yeah, it's it's just too bad our quarterback's from California, but uh, it'll it'll be tough. But uh, I, you know, obviously we're all. (laughs) <laughs> fawning back for this back team. It's it's real hard, you know. Remember that this it, replay is on Sunday. Yeah, it's a good, it's yeah. a good, it's yeah. it is a good matchup. I think mm-hmm. it's a tough matchup, but it's real hard. I think it would have been harder for us to win <laughs> oh. this week if we lost if we last lost, week. Right. I, I, agree. Uh, I mean, if we'd won last week. Uh, so uh, and and in a lot of ways, and I and I say this every year. I I always take the position that the Packers are going to win until they lose. And and brilliant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and I've never been wrong about that. And and the Brewers are always at, here, playoff bound. Here, here at the, here at the end of this season, everything is coming together at the right time. We've now got some some running backs uh, who are actually real good, and and we've got going to have the whole array of receivers back from and injuries. Defensive. Uh, and and yeah, and and and. And we're coming together in every aspect, and and I don't see any reason why we can't plow through the playoffs. It'll be, you know, if we beat Minnesota, it'll be San Francisco the next week, and and uh, and their quarterback is down now. He's but not but, but it, not, it doesn't get any easier. But we, there any reason why we? Well, can't. you've got think, Seattle and Atlanta to worry you, about you, too. You've got Jennings and Driver, and I don't think they want a loss to be their swan song with the Packers. Uh, if uh, Driver gets a chance to play. Uh, and certainly Jennings is going to want to disprove what uh, mm-hmm. his sister <laughs> threw out there on the, uh, the Twitter uh, blog. What if it it's, comes down to a field goal on the he frozen, t- not drop on, a ball. On the frozen no. tundra by yeah. Crosby? Missing Crosby, not Mason Crosby. Missing Crosby. <laughs> what if it comes down to that? Oh, I missing Crosby, not Mason Crosby. You know what? Please, dear Lord, be no. An exciting you know, he, he, he seems to be picking, you know, picking up his, his pride again. He seems to have his head in the right place. Let's, let's not worry about it coming down to that. But if it does, I, I, I think it'll be okay. All right, well, <laughs> the 113th Congress was sworn into office this week, but not before the 112th Congress took its own budget drama right down to the wire. People on both sides of the aisle have been griping about the results, but Rick Horowitz sees a little ray of sunshine in all that late-night deal-making. Rick. So you know the old and only slightly tasteless story, right, about the rich guy who says to the sweet and pure young thing, if I gave you a million dollars, would you make love to me? And the sweet young thing says, "Uh, why, yes, yes, I would. So then the guy says, how about if I gave you $20? And she says, absolutely not. What do you think I am? And he says, we've already established what you are. We're just haggling over the price. Well, Republicans in Congress have finally found their price. On taxes, I mean. Some actual Republican office holders actually voted in favor of higher taxes for the first time in decades. Literally, the first time in decades. 40 GOP senators and 85 GOP House members found a price they were willing to accept. Or maybe I should say they saw a cliff they weren't willing to go over, at least not if they were going to take most of the blame for it. So they voted in favor of higher income tax rates and higher estate taxes for the very wealthiest, and higher rates on dividends and capital gains, too. And their votes, plus votes from House and Senate Democrats, made it happen. And I say congratulations. 
Now, I don't want to go overboard here. The GOP hasn't exactly raised the white flag. Just wait till the debt ceiling fight starts. And even on this fiscal cliff deal, the Senate vote may have been overwhelmingly in favor, but nearly two-thirds of John Boehner's House Republicans voted against it. Still, it's a start. It's one small step away from the orthodoxy, the religious fanaticism, really, of no new taxes, no way, no how, for no purpose, ever. Maybe it's only a strategic retreat, or maybe reality has finally set in, and we can start to have a sensible conversation about the kind and size of government we want, and what it costs to provide it, and where the money to pay for it should come from. Now we can start haggling over the price. That's a conversation worth having. But the main thing is the spell has been broken. There's no going back. You can only be a virgin the first time. Well, thanks, Rick, and thank you so very much for watching. Stay warm. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.